I have been walking around the stores lately. I have been, con been confronted with death. Not my own mortality kind of confrontation with death, but the never-ending displays of Halloween decorations everywhere, including, apparently, this congregation. It's very lovely. Well, there are skeletons, gravestones, and miniature graveyards. The Grim Reaper greets me every time I enter my local CVS. Neighborhood displays of Halloween decorations, it seems to me, are getting more elaborate with lights and glowing ghosts. My friend sent me a Facebook photo of this old house with artificial skeletons crawling all over it. Has anybody else seen this? This is hysterical. <laughs> Um, I love this stuff. Halloween is one of my favorite holidays. This over-the-top playfulness and parody of death is often our way of releasing our own fears and anxieties about death. And in a story I read to the children about Day of the Dead, it shows how other cultures also confront and try and deal with the reality of death, turning it into a celebration of the lives of those they have loved who have died. In these Day of the Dead celebrations, people flirt with and dance with death. Too often in our culture, when it is not Halloween, we often keep death hidden. I read recently that in the mid-1800s, in order that they learn to accept the reality of death early, children, especially girls, were given death kits. These included gravestones, black clothing, and a figure they could play with and dress for burial. This may seem a little bit macabre to our contemporary ears, but the reality was that then death was not hidden. Most people died and were prepared for burial at home. It was the role of the women to prepare the bodies for burial, and they wanted the girls to be able to be prepared to perform this particular death ritual when it was their time to do so. Religious traditions arose that could sometimes make death even scarier, or offer a way of looking at death that might provide solace. The promise of immortality in the afterlife, in the Christian tradition, both gave people the caution of being moral in the present, but also softened the blow of death of a loved one in the thought that they, they may not really be wholly gone, and that they might be enjoying something beyond this life. In the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, the death rituals included prayers that walked the deceased through their first days in their path toward either reincarnation or moving beyond the cycles of reincarnation. These death rituals, beliefs, and practices still bring solace to the grief of those left behind. But something has changed over the years in our relationship to death. We have sanitized, institutionalized, and rendered death mostly invisible. The miracles of modern medicine have often given us the reassurance that death may be postponed or possibly endless, life may continue endlessly. For some in our contemporary times who have eschewed religious practice and traditions, but nevertheless want to somehow grasp eternity, and who believe the exponential progress of human ingenuity, they believe that we might actually be able to live forever. These are a group of people who call themselves immortalists, Aubrey de Grey being the most famous of them. They believe that within our lifetime, scientific breakthroughs will make it possible for people to live for 200, maybe a thousand years, maybe forever. De Grey believes it is the basic right of every human to live as long as they want. 
that humans will get to pick the age to which they want to reach 21, 30, 35, and then be able to maintain the health of that age for as long as they want. De Grey believes given the choice, humans would eventually and inevitably choose life extension over having children. <laughs> Ray Kurzweil, famous innovator and inventor, and now a lead researcher at Google, believes in a future in which human memory and consciousness will be able to be digitized and downloaded, that eventually even a biologically based body may no longer be necessary for survival, <laughs> that some sort of human, robotic, digital hybrid will be the substrate in which our consciousness survives so that we might no longer fear death because death will no longer be inevitable. These scenarios of physical immortality are fascinating, yet even skeptics of souls living into eternity are aware that such a wish is a form of ego attachment, a wish for our individual consciousnesses to continue. But the continuation of physical life has so much many more consequences. What if nobody had to die? What if everybody could live forever? Just think about that for a second. Does that scenario raise as many red flags for you as it does for me? De Grey and others can see that these technologies would only be available at first for those who had the money to afford them. In his mind, this is as it should be because people who have access, the rich and the successful, these are the ones who should usher in their brave new world. Just think about that for a second. Does that not raise even more red flags? <laughs> With all that being said, and holding it in mind, for those of us who don't have grandiose visions of physically living forever, is not death, in fact, an impetus to life? Martin Heidegger once wrote, if I take death into my life, acknowledge it, and face it squarely, I will free myself from the anxiety of death and the pettiness of life. And only then will I be free to become myself. Heidegger's greatest fear was not death, but immortality. And for us, think about what it would mean to live forever. Would we ever do anything? <laughs> In Grace, De Grey's scenario, we would not be indestructible. We simply would not age. We could get hit by a car, shot by a bullet, die in any number of other ways. Would living then possibly involve not taking any risks? Not doing anything that might involve other kinds of death? The young people I know have this expression, YOLO, you only live once. It is used to rationalize taking significant risks in their lives, both in order to grow but also when they have attempted something stupid and survived to tell about it. If we knew we could live forever, would we ever climb a mountain or even do something simple like swim in the ocean or ride a bicycle? All these things have other kinds of risk. Would the risks outweigh our want to take chances? Another strange question arises, what wouldn't we do if we could live forever? <laughs> De Grey believes, as I mentioned, that people would choose life extension over having children. I'm not sure I believe him. <laughs> would that be one of the things that people would choose to give up to live forever? Which led me to the question, what does make life more precious? Imagine your bucket list, if you have one. We create bucket lists in order that we can imagine those things that would make our lives just a little more full. But knowing that because life is finite, we might only ever accomplish a few of them. Unless we have extraordinary monetary needs, most of us cannot travel the world on a whim. Imagine that once in a lifetime vacation that is planned for a long time, and then finally experiencing it. It's that once in a lifetime part that makes that vacation so precious. And perhaps 
unlike the gray, having children is something that you would like to experience or have experienced. And ask yourself, hasn't that made life just a little more sweet? Isn't the experience of meeting new people, fostering relationships, even if they are fleeting, worth it, even with the possibility of loss? In the book, A Year to Live, poet and meditation teacher Stephen Levine, who has worked with many people who were dying, explores the idea of what it would mean to live as though one only had one year left to live. He writes about practices that help a person savor the life that they already do have. He writes about forgiveness and gratitude. He writes about imagining one's own death in order to live more fully. A couple of summers ago, I explored my own mortality in the context of being a hospital chaplain. Assigned to the neurology floor, the vast majority of my patients were stroke patients, and it didn't take me a long time to figure out that the age of the patients on the floor, the average age of the patients on the floor, was my age. <laughs> Along with seeing patients, we also had practical learning sessions. Not a few of these were on issues surrounding end of life, from the ethics of end of life to how to have a good death. Learning that sometimes healing does not involve the assumption that someone isn't going to die. And I watched patients, and I sat with them, and I listened to them as they contemplated difficult decisions. I sat with them as they died, and I remembered their deaths. One patient that I visited with and got to know fairly well was a woman wrestling with her own death. She was a lively, friendly wo woman who all the nurses loved. She had farmed her family farm for 50 years and had made it into a lucrative concern, and she told me all about it. She had never married and had no children, but she had a very close, supportive community of friends. Her room was decorated with cards and wildflowers, and she almost always had visitors. I knew from looking at her chart that she was a very sick woman. One evening, we were sitting in her room, and the surgeon came in. A young woman eager to get her work done, the surgeon started describing a surgery they wanted my patient to undergo. It was not related to her cancer, but it might relieve some of her symptoms. It was a fairly invasive, aggressive surgery. The young doctor was insistent that my patient decide so they could put her on the surgery schedule. My patient listened to the surgeon intently and said, I'll think about it. When the surgeon left, she turned to me and asked, how do I know when enough is enough? She said, when my parents were dying, they just died. They didn't have to make all these decisions. How do I know when to tell them to save their procedures for those for whom they might make a difference? The immortalists have it wrong, I believe. They have it wrong because it is not living forever that live, gives life meaning, but knowing that one only has a finite time. Wanting to physically live forever is the ultimate form of human hubris in a materialistic, consumerist society. It is, I think, the extreme form of selfishness and self-absorption, not knowing when enough is enough, not knowing what it means to love. As I grappled with death during my chaplain internship, as I sat and listened to people struggling to make sense of life, I asked myself, what if this moment is all that I have? Gabriel Ba writes in his book Day Tripper, only when you accept that one day you will die can you let go and make the best of life. And that's the secret. That's the miracle. In an interview with a journalist, Aubrey de Grey was asked, if you could live forever, what would you do? And de Grey gave a list of things he would like to do, read novels, watch movies, have time for leisure. When the journalist asked him why he did not do those things right now, 
He said he did not have time. Uh -huh. He was too busy researching how to live forever. <laughs> <laughs> he would put them off until he knew his own immortality was assured. <laughs> this is both ironic and sad. There is this cartoon in which a busy man is sitting at his computer, and the Grim Reaper walks in. The man looks up. Thank goodness you're here, he says. I can't accomplish anything unless I have a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> May we honor our mortal deadlines and take the time to cherish all that life has to offer. Amen, and blessed be. <laughs>